folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from our top secret broadcasting studio with another Watchman video broadcast. We're going to finish something. I've started all these series and we were talking about the fourth kingdom and we've been talking about the singularity and the secret of the seal on the one dollar bill and then we moved into Babylon's mystery or understanding Babylon's mystery. And I think out of all the series that we've started, this well, I won't say that we're going to finish it today either, because there's many, many other things in the Bible that pertain to, to Mystery Babylon. But I am going to finish this part of it, dealing with what is the mystery of Babylon? Where do we get that from? Let's go back. Revelation chapter 17, and there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials. I want you to think of this number seven and how it pops up here, because we're going to deal with that today. There came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. John is going to, sh or excuse me, the angel is going to show John what's going to happen. And remember, this angel, he's not Mr. Nice Guy. He is a servant of the Most High God, and he has a vial in his hand, and that vial is one of the seven vials that's going to be poured out upon the earth in the last days, Therein, Babylon is going to get her judgment. She's going to get what she's got coming. Now, that's I think, is a theme all in its own, something very important to remember, that it looks like sometimes people do things that are wrong. Seemingly, they get away with it. But let me assure you, God sees and he knows everything. God writes it all down. And when it comes to men or women, boy and girl, young or old, doesn't matter. When they do things that are wrong, if it's unrepented, God is going to deal with it. And so he's going to deal with Mystery Babylon the Great. So let's skip on down to verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And here again, here's this number seven you notice that she's sitting upon a beast that has seven heads, ten horns. We look in Revelation 13. We see the beast um, that is also talked about in Revelation 17. He has seven heads and ten horns. We go to Revelation chapter 12. We have the great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns as well. And we know that that dragon is the serpent, that old devil and Satan, because that's what verse 9 says. And so... He, he, here, he sees her riding the scarlet colored beast. Verse 4, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. She's made herself look alluring, hasn't she? She has really decked herself out. And she uses things like, like eye candy, we call it. Things that are pleasant to the eye, like what Eve saw in the Garden of Eden. She uses things that are pleasant to the eyes, it's called the lust of the eyes, to allure people over to her. Uh, you remembered what Jezebel did. When here comes Jehu riding across the plain, and she sees Jehu out there, and she's told who it was. The Bible says she tired her head. And that doesn't mean she put a car tire on her head or a wagon wheel. She attired herself. She made herself look as pretty as any old witch could look. She wanted to try to allure Jehu, but Jehu was tired of it, and he said, I'm going to get rid of her. So anyway, she has a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, and here's the, the meaning of our series here. Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. Thirteen words, we talked about that, and we're going to look at that again. We're going to go back to Jericho and get some understanding from this. And anyway... Her name is Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And um, he says, and I saw the woman, verse 6, drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery. This is, this is one of my favorite things. When I, when I learned this in the scripture several years ago, that blessed me. Because I just looked at every place, like we've been doing in this series, I looked at every place in the King James Bible that deals with the word mystery, or has the word mystery, or mysteries in it. And the word mystery itself is mentioned 22 times. Well, 22 is a number for revelation. 
There are 22 chapters in the book of Revelation. It's the 66th book. That would be 22 times 3. There's many other things. I won't talk about that. But every time you see the word mystery, even her name, mystery, remember, she likes to keep things secret. She likes to keep things veiled and covered. Israel right now has a veil over their head. The Bible says that every time the Jew reads the Old Testament, there's a veil there. And any place a veil is there hiding and, and covering things so that people cannot see, you're going to see Mystery Babylon the Great at work. She is the spirit, I believe, that right now is keeping Israel in darkness, her and the devil. But every time the word mystery is used, the Bible, right here, tells you what that mystery is. And if you look there in verse 7, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. So, what we've been doing in this series is rather simple. We just go through the scriptures, we look for the word mystery or mysteries, all of them are in the New Testament, and when we see where a certain mystery is revealed, we use that to gain understanding as to what the nature, uh, the modus operandi, the method of operation of Mystery Babylon, how she works, how she conceals, what it is that she does, and the fact that her religion is the exact opposite of Bible Christianity. Let me show you what I mean by that. We're now to the point we're looking at the word mystery, and we've gotten our way to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. The Bible says... A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, I want you to catch all this now, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, and then in verse 9, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. So here's the, and this is one of the two places in the Bible, I think the other one is in uh, Titus, I believe, where you find the qualifications of a bishop. A bishop simply is an overseer of a church. The word bishop, the word pastor, they all uh, have the idea of someone who is a shepherd over a flock. Jesus is the great shepherd. He is the one who's in charge of all the flocks everywhere. He is the one who's supposed to be in charge of the overseers or the bishops. Christ is the great bishop of our soul. And these qualifications here, Christ matches them perfectly. And there's been more than one preacher, myself included, that's looked at the qualifications of a bishop. And we've never patted, on ourselves, patted ourselves on the back and said, boy, do I qualify for that. Every honest preacher, every honest bishop will look at that and say, Jesus, I have things to work on. Would you help me to be qualified to be in the position in the office that you called me to be? I believe God is good that way. We see then Jesus being perfect. By the way, he's the husband of one wife. That means he was not married to Mary Magdalene, like the Da Vinci Code says, and then he's going to marry us, the church. Wrong. That gives him two wives, and now he's disqualified from being the bishop of our souls. But anyway, looking back at this bishop's thing and the qualification and how it's connected to the mystery. A bishop or an overseer is to be blameless. Now, think about this. Jezebel, who is a picture of Mystery Babylon the Great, she had her preachers, didn't she? She had, according to the scriptures, 450 fellas that sat at her table. What I see in that is, here is Jezebel, and she pays and takes care of her boys pretty good. She's got these preachers doing and saying exactly what she wants them to say, and she takes care of them, she feeds them, she probably does other things for them. Definitely, spiritually, these 450 prophets would be in bed with Jezebel spiritually, in bed with Mystery Babylon the Great, they have joined themselves and made themselves one with the harlot who is Jezebel. And so you'd look at Jezebel's prophets. They were liars. They were all kinds of things. They were following after Baal. 
And you look at the qualifications here and then go to any preacher, any minister, any bishop in the world who says that they are a bishop of Jesus Christ and yet Mystery Babylon is holding the reins of their life and their ministry. So number one, they're not going to be blameless. They're going to be full of blame. All kinds of things going on behind the scenes that most people don't know about. By the way, you know what I see here? A bishop then must be blameless. The truth of it is, every pastor, even the good ones that you know, they've all done something wrong. How does a bishop become blameless? He has his sins removed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You would say, well, that's kind of a, a given, isn't it? Not necessarily. Not in the world we live today. I think we have, in essence, behind pulpits, a lot of unregenerated, unsaved bishops who work for Mystery Babylon the Great. They've never had the blame of their sin removed. And they keep adding blame on to blame. Husband and one wife. We have, we have ministers, bishops, pastors over churches who have multiple wives, multiple divorces, multiple affairs, and they still refer to themselves or want other people to regard them as pastor. This is Babylon the Great. This is her guys here. Vigilant. You know what that means? They're watchmen. They're watching what's going on. You know what I'm hearing from people all over the world? We, pastor, we cannot find a pastor that would be a watchman on the wall over me and my family. We can't find anybody like that. We don't have a lot of vigilant pastors. Uh, this word vigilant makes me think there's a website called Vigilant Citizen and somebody and I were talking about it the other day and, and what they do is they like to look at movies and TV shows and rock concerts and things like that and expose and show the symbolism, kind of like what I do. But when you look at the Vigilant Citizen uh, website, you kind of get the idea that whoever runs this, they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. So while they may be good at spotting the works of the Illuminati, they fail to see that they themselves need redemption and when you're not on Jesus' side, you're on the enemy's side. But here's my point. Guys like Alex Jones, Vigilant Citizen, uh, even David Icke over in England, who is so new age to the core. Why is it that the church or pastors leave it up to those guys who, as far as I'm concerned, are lost and don't know the Savior? They, they may claim to be Christian. Why is it that pastors are leaving it up to those guys to spot what's going on in this world? Why is it the pastors being diligent and vigilant and sounding the alarm before the sword comes in the cities, Ezekiel chapter 33? That's one of the marks of Mystery Babylon and how she has hold over a pastor. Then we have sober. Obviously, Mystery Babylon has a cup, and what she does with that cup is that she makes people drunk. There are drunken pastors. There are people who are drunk in the spirit. There are pastors who are drunks and alcoholics. They're drunk on wine. They're drunk on strong drink. They're drunk on pornography. They're drunk on everything else in the world. They're not sober, not of good behavior, not given to hospitality, not apt to teach. Then we look down. They hold the mystery of the faith. Real bishops will hold the mystery of the faith right here in a pure conscience. Now let me explain this word conscience. Look at this verse again. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. The word conscience, I like words. I like English words. They fascinate me. It's like, I like to be a, like a forensic entomologist. That ent entomologist is a bug guy. Etymology, that's what I'm trying to say. I like to be a forensic etymologist. I like to dissect words and cut them up in pieces and find out where they came from. The word conscience it's two Latin words, con, which means with, pasta con broccoli means pasta with broccoli. Con means with. Science is where the word, is, it means knowledge. With knowledge is what conscience means. So let me explain it, okay? Johnny hit his sister Sally in the nose. Sally goes running to mommy. Mommy, mommy, Johnny hit me in the nose. She goes to Johnny. Johnny, is that true? Now, Mama knows Johnny. She gave birth to him. She's been looking in his eyes now for 10 years. 
And whenever Johnny starts to lie, mommy knows about it. How? Because Johnny has a conscience. He has an aspect of his mind and his brain and his soul that knows what he did with knowledge. He knows. And what happens is, and God designed us this way, this is why lie detectors in a lot of cases, not all cases, in a lot of cases work the way they do, is that people, when they are going to tell the truth, there's certain things that their face will do that kind of let people know I am telling the truth. When a person's going to lie, you know what he's got to do? He's got to draw a picture. He has to come up with some fantasy idea that doesn't exist in reality, and he has to present that to his mother in hopes that she'll believe it. There has to be an alternate story. He can't just say, Mo Mommy can't just say, Johnny, did you hit Sally? No. Well, that's the end of the discussion right there. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. She's not going to have, he's got to come up with a story. And Mommy knows. Mommy can read that poker face all day and all night long. Because Johnny has a conscience, there are certain things about his face, about his hands, maybe about his legs or whatever, maybe he gets fidgety. Maybe he starts looking off in other directions, and Mommy will say, look me in the eye. Mommy knows, because Johnny knows what he did was wrong. That's a conscience. Pastors, church people, God's people, God gave you a conscience. You know what that conscience is for? That conscience is to take you to the cross of Jesus Christ with the knowledge that you know what you did was wrong. That's why God gave it to us. And so here... Paul admonishes and says the characteristics, the, the traits of a bishop, the qualifications of a bishop, is that they hold the mystery of the faith, that is the Word of God, the inerrant, inspired Word of God, in a pure conscience. Let me tell you what I think partly that means. Preacher stands up in front of the congregation and he says, Man, I love the Word of God. It's the infallible, inspired, inerrant Word of God in the original manuscripts. Now, your King James says this, but in the original Greek, it says something else. You know what he's doing? He's double-talking. He wants to sound like he's conservative, like he believes the Bible and the inerrancy of the Bible, and the Bible's it. But the truth of it is, he learned back in Bible college and seminary that you can't trust the Bibles. That's what he was taught. And so he knows that he's double-speaking when he tells people, of course I believe in the inerrancy of the Bible. But that only applies to the original manuscripts. But you can trust me to tell you what it says. Man doesn't have a pure conscience. He's going to have to, he's either going to have to reveal to everybody, of course I don't believe the Bible's true. He's either going to have to reveal that, or he's going to have to lie about it. But either way, he won't have a pure conscience. Let's look at other places in the Bible that refer to the word conscience. Romans chapter 2, verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. Romans 9, 1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. There it is right there. That whole scenario I laid out with Mommy and Johnny and Sally, it's right there in your King James Bible in Romans chapter 2 and Romans chapter 9. The Bible's telling you that your conscience bears witness. It will either bear witness for you when you tell people, this is what I believe. I believe that my Bible has no errors in it. And when I tell people that, hopefully they'll be able to look into my eye and know that I believe what I'm saying. Whether they agree with me or not, they'll know that I believe what I'm saying. My conscience is going to bear witness that what I say I believe, I believe. I believe it yesterday, I believe it today, and I'll believe it tomorrow too. That's what my conscience bears witness. But back up here in Romans chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible says, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile, either accusing or excusing them. Isn't that neat? Look at, look at what that says. Your conscience is going to bear witness of your actions, your deeds, and your beliefs. And your conscience is either going to accuse you or excuse you. It's either going to accuse you while you're trying to say, I didn't do it, I, 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 just like Peter. 
I, I, I don't know Jesus. And then he didn't start cursing. You know what it was? His conscience was bearing witness against him. His conscience was accusing him of lying, saying that he had been not been with Christ. Boy, this Bible's right, isn't it? And so just think about that. Now, there, there are ministers of God who hold the mystery of the faith in an undefiled, pure conscience. And they don't have a problem telling you, I believe every word of God. And if it's not in the Bible, I don't believe it. You say that you were taught that the universe came about 14 billion years ago. I'm telling you that that's a lie. I believe my Bible says 6,000 years ago, tops. And we're about ready to hit the Sabbath day, the 1,000 year reign, and I think people ought to be getting ready. See, guys who really believe that, you can tell it by their voice, by their eyes, their conscience is bearing with them. Then you got those that sit at the table of Jezebel who will say one thing in one crowd and say another thing in another crowd. They'll talk, and listen, I know how this works. Remember, I used to be on the other side of the King James issue. Used to be there. You know what I heard from guys who didn't believe the King James and I would sit in and listen to them talk? You know, you know what I heard? They would say, these, man, these people, I got these people in my church and they're so hung up on the King James and it's all King James. Well, how, how, how come you don't use the King James Bible? And you can just he, hear the dis, distaste and the disgust in their voice. And yet, they'll get up in front of their congregation and say, we're going to use the King James. And really, the King James is such a, it's a beautiful translation, isn't it? Talking out of two sides of their mouth, their conscience is defiled it's going to bear witness against them now there are some people i believe whose conscience doesn't bear witness you can't tell by their conscience and i'll show you that first peter chapter 3 verse 18 for christ also hath once suffered for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to god being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the spirit by which also he went and preached in the spirits unto spirits in prison which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water the light figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us not the putting away of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ now, I put a lot of verses here around this word conscious but I want you to understand the circle that it's in, the, the area, the context that it's in. The answer of a good conscience. You know what that means. Here he's talking about baptism, but he's not talking about water baptism. He can't be, because he specifically says, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Water baptism in a baptistry or a lake or a river or a pond or somebody's swimming pool. Water baptism does not purify the soul. At best... It can clean the filth of the fet, off the flesh. At best, that's what it can do. Inward, Holy Spirit baptism. Christ washing his church with the water by his word. That's what can clean our conscience. You say, well, we still know we did it. But here's something else. We have a new knowledge now that supersedes what we did. You see... We've all done things in our past. We've all done things that we'd rather forget, things that we don't want anybody to keep bringing up all the time, we, and things that bother us that we did. We just shake our head and go, why did I ever do that? Why did I ever say to that? Why did I ever run, run with these people? Why did I do this? And while somebody who may not like you may try to bring up your past, your past against you, and you would think that your conscience is going to say, well, yeah, that's you know what he said. You're, Mike, you're a dirty, low-down scoundrel. Why don't you go run off and die somewhere? You see, my conscience has been purified by the water of the Word of God. While I know that I've done things and said things and believed things and was part of things that I should have never been part of, while I know that, I have a knowledge that overrides that. That knowledge is knowing that all of my sins, all of my transgressions, all of my failures, all of my bad ideas are all under the blood of Jesus Christ, washed clean by the water of the Word of God. And I know that I have been forgiven of them. So while you may accuse me, well, he said this or he used to do that or whatever, 
I can look you straight in the eye and say, yeah, every one of those things are true, but I'm telling you, my God has forgiven me, and I stand here with a clean conscience. Isn't it great? That's Mystery Babylon's preachers, they won't be able to do that. They won't be able to do that. Let me show you this. 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having, look at it, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. And I want you to look, I've got a couple graphics here to kind of illustrate that. Number one, Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy in the last days, the Spirit is expressing this on it. If you look at the word express, it has the word press in it. Like impression, express, uh, depress, whatever. Oppress, it has the word press in it. The Spirit is speaking expressly. It's really trying to drive this idea home with you so that you watch out and you know what's going on. Because there are, right now, and there will continue to be, and it's going to get worse and worse, men who have departed from what? The faith. I've been dealing with Jim Staley, the head, one of the heads of these Hebrew Roots people. And here's a, another one of these guys. I think that's Mark Biltz. And he's up there doing this Vulcan live long and prosper Jewish blessing. And what that is is three here and three here. Sons of God, daughters of men, yin and yang, the opposites joining together. That's what that is, by the way. Okay, if there was a way for the human hand to make a triangle all by itself, that's what they would do. But you see the three here and the three here. 33 or 6 as in Genesis chapter 6 that's what that is and Jim Staley and these other guys I think it's possible that they have gone past being able to be brought back by sound doctrine they have departed from the faith and one of the premier tenets and beliefs of not just the Hebrew Roots Movement, but the Roman Catholic Church and every other religion in the world other than Bible Christianity is they depart from faith in that they believe that pleasing God comes from doing and not believing. They've departed from the faith. They've given heed to what kind of spirits was that? Seducing. Remember how I told you Babylon likes to really doll herself up? put on them nice clothes that kind of expose a little bit and leave a little bit to the imagination and makes herself real pretty. What she's trying to do, she's trying to seduce people. And it works. It works very, very well. Seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared, seared with a hot iron. You know what that means? I, I worked, I don't know if I should admit this, two days at McDonald's when I was in college. I just wouldn't cut out for that. One of the things they taught me how to do, in fact, that's probably the only thing I really remember, was how to sear a burger. Take a burger patty, frozen burger patty, put it on the grill, and back then, this is back before the days where they had the pull-down grill that cooked it on top and bottom. They had a little handheld thing, piece of aluminum, fit right in the palm of your hand, and they taught me, when you got all the patty burgers laid down, sear them. Go around and around on them. Press them down into that, into that hot plate. Why? Because that puts a crusty skin over the top surface of the burger so that the juices, which is really grease, stay in the meat. That's what I learned about searing hamburgers. Never forget that as long as I live. The same thing is applied here. We take hamburgers and put them on a hot iron. They have taken their conscience and their conscience has been seared with a hot iron, which means nothing gets out and nothing gets in and nothing affects them. They can look at you and lie through their teeth and think nothing of it. These people, polygraph tests, lie detector tests will not work on them. Some say that there are people like sociopaths or psychopaths who have the ability to lie 
and they would never trigger the alarm on a lie detector test. Why? Something mentally wrong with them, and to them, lying is just as easy as telling the truth. Well, here are these preachers in the last days whose conscience has been seared with a hot iron. They commit in sin, they live in adultery, they, some of them live in sodomy. They live the, the most vulgar, wicked lifestyles in the world, and yet they get up every Sunday and act like they are really something spiritual. And nothing, fa they don't have a guilty conscience over it. Why? Conscience seared with a hot iron. Who did that? Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Forbidding to marry, Roman Catholic Church, commanding to abstain from meats, Hebrew Roots Movement, uh, Jewish movement, that's what the Jews went around telling them. Oh, you can't. I was told by I don't know how many people, Mike, you, you know you shouldn't be eating pork, you know you shouldn't be eating bacon, you know you shouldn't be doing that, you can't be doing that. God didn't change the law. No, God didn't change the law. He cleaned the unclean things with prayer and thanksgiving, with the Word of God and thanksgiving. That's what the Bible says. See, I don't have, a, I don't have an issue. I don't have a problem with that. I know the freedom and the liberty that God gives us as New Testament believers in Jesus Christ. And I guarantee you, if I, if I knew I was doing something wrong, my conscience would eat me alive. It does. You just ask my wife. You ask anybody around me. That's how it works. Pray. Listen to me. Pray that God would always give you a soft heart and a conscience that is never seared so that when you do something wrong, you can't stand yourself until you repent and get it washed and clean. That's what you need to be. But anyway, so you understand this idea. This, the bishop is to hold the mystery of the faith, undefiled, pure, and he's to have a clean conscience before God, saying, I know this book, I know what it says, I know who I am, I am nothing, and this book is everything. Mystery of Babylon, she's got her guys out there, and her ladies, too, and they're defiled. Their conscience seared with a hot iron. Here's another example of that. Titus chapter 1, verse 15. Under the pure, all things are pure. That means if God has sanctified you, if, if God has sanctified you, you know that your Bible is 100% pure. Those who are truly sanctified in Christ know that their Bible has no mistakes in it. Under the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind, look at here, and their conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Here's a church, a mega church leader claims divine wind moved him to fully accept members practicing homosexuality. An apostate pastor in the Bible Belt who leads the congregation that country star Carrie Underwood attends recently announced from the pulpit that not only can practicing homosexuals be members, but those in sexual sin can now fully serve in his church and will be allowed to marry at the facility. Our position that these siblings of our... You know what siblings are. It's brothers and sisters. Other than heterosexual, cannot have the full privileges of membership but only partial membership has changed. Stan Mitchell of Grace Point Church in Franklin, Tennessee announced earlier this month as some clapped and others sat silently in disapproval. I, I Listen, if I'd have been my church, I wouldn't have sat silently in disapproval. I would have shouted and run out of there and say, this house has got Ichabod written all over it. You see, this man will get up there and... So what is it, a Baptist church? Okay, in the Bible, I don't know what kind of church it is. They've, they've hidden their denomination. They're just now Grace Point, okay, which is the center point, cross point. The, I'm going to get into all that. But anyway, this man, I'm assuming he's read the Bible. But I'm going to tell you something. He does not have the indwelling Word of God in him. No way, no how. And he can stand up in front of everybody knowing, knowing that the Bible says these things are sin. And stand up and say, not only will we accept them into full membership, we'll marry them because I've had a divine wind. I bet that wind stinks. He had some kind of divine wind. You know what a wind is? It's a spirit, seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. They go hand in hand with a defiled conscience. Now, that is 
we're getting close to the end of where all the mysteries are located in the scriptures. Now we're going to go to the book of Revelation. Okay, this is where it's going to get interesting. And, and by the way, the, the mystery is about to be finished. The one who is keeping everything a mystery. She's just about to be finished. Amen? Can't wait for it. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. And when I saw him, this is John, he saw Jesus. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And, he, and stop right here. That is not slain in the spirit. That is not slain in the spirit. Practically everybody who's slain in the spirit falls backwards and they lose consciousness. John fell forward at his feet as dead. Maybe all his strength went out of him. But it says, as dead, not slain, not murdered. Christ didn't murder, kill his spirit. I believe the Bible. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now we're looking at the mystery of the seven stars. Here is Jesus. He's got seven stars in his hand. What is that? What does that represent? It's a mystery. But remember, the mysteries are revealed to us who are the church, the believers, because we have the New Testament. We have all these mysteries revealed to us. So the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. Now he's going to tell you, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Here's another clue in our Bible. Stars equal angels. Always in the Bible, stars equal angels. The host of heaven, they're stars, they're angels. The dragon takes a third of the stars, casts them out of heaven. He's taking a third of the angels. That's what he's doing. But here we have the seven stars representing the, uh, the angels or the messengers, the watchers over, the guardians, you might call it, of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And here's what's interesting. I love this. Okay, You take this number seven, you go through all the scriptures, and you'll... And, there are so many things that it's connected with, but every one of them are connected to be one and the same. And I'll show you that from Scripture, because we have seven stars. Stars give light. The Word of God is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. Angels are ministers of light, the Bible says. And so the seven stars are the seven angels, bright, light, uh, guides, and so on. Uh, the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. But we're also going to see that the seven candlesticks represent the seven spirits of God, which also um, bear witness by the seven horns that are in Jesus in Revelation chapter 5, which match the seven locks that are in Samson's hair in Judges chapter 16, which uh, bears witness to the... Let me read the verses, okay? I'm getting ahead of myself. I just love this kind of stuff. Look at it. Revelation chapter 4, verse 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Isaiah 11 tells you what these seven spirits are. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. I, I did a sermon series. It took me forever. It took me more than seven weeks, I'll tell you that, to deal with each one of the seven spirits of God. It was a wonderful, wonderful study. I'm not saying it because it was me. If you know me, you know I just give tons of Bible verses. And when you collect all those verses together, God will give you understanding about what those spirits are, what they do for the believer, what they do for the church, what they do... Uh, in a home and things like that. And I love that kind of stuff. But the seven spirits of God are listed there in Isaiah 11. And it's telling us that Jesus, now I want you, here's where I want you to start thinking about this. Because we're going to flip it upside down. Here's Jesus. 
and he is the rod, the stem of Jesse, and he has the seven spirits of God. Um, and we know that bear, the book of Revelation, chapter 5, bears witness with that because he has seven horns like a ram in his head, which are, the Bible says specifically, these are the seven spirits of God. Now, think about all this, okay? Think about Christ. The opposite would be Antichrist. Mystery, uh, the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of God, Mystery Babylon's harlot spirits, okay? We're going to see them. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. There's one body. Let's count this. There's one body, that's one, and one spirit, that's two. Even as ye are called in one hope, that's three of your calling. One Lord, four. One faith, five. One baptism, six. One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. See how they're connected together with this number seven? You say, well, no, the seven, the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. No, 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 the seven candlesticks are the spirit. Seven spirits of God. What do you say, Pastor Hoggard? I say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. And they're not separate from one another. The church is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes about as a result of Jesus Christ, who is the Word of God, and the Father is Father over all of them. They're, all, they're not separate from one another. Um, anyway, one body and one spirit. Uh, I don't have two different things in my body that breathes air. Just have one. One spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith. Not two or three or four different gospels that people have to abide under. One. One faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Hallelujah. Say amen. By the way, in your King James Bible, the phrase Holy Spirit is found exactly seven times. Wow. Say it backwards. Wow. Isn't that cool? I, I, I was thinking that, you know, the phrase Holy Spirit, well, that'd be, you know, like hundreds of times in the Bible. The phrase Holy Ghost, 90 times in the King James Bible. 90 has to do with fruit bearing. Think about Sarah, how old she was when she bore fruit. She was 90 years old, wasn't she? And she carried that baby for how long? How long? Not 90 months, nine months. The Holy Ghost. Remember what was said concerning Mary, the mother of Jesus? Okay? She's bearing, she, she has the fruit of her womb, which was given her by the Holy Ghost. I love it. Anyway, the Holy Spirit, that phrase, seven times in the King James Bible. Uh, go to purebiblesearch.com, download a free copy of our Bible search software. It searches only the King James. It's for Windows, Linux, or Macintosh. Put it on any one of those or all of them. Get as many copies as you want. Get copies, make copies. Give them out to people. We don't care. It's for free. Okay, that's what it's supposed to do. It's actually under a free license, by the way. But anyway, you type in that phrase, Holy Spirit. You'll find seven times in the King James Bible it's there. Okay, here's one of them. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Think about the seven spirits of God, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 4.30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. And so here we have the seven spirits of God, we have, the, we have a book in God's right hand in Revelation chapter 5 that is sealed with seven seals. What is that seven seals? It's the seven spirits of God. And the only one who is qualified to open the seven seals is the Lamb who has seven eyes and seven horns because those are the seven spirits of God. Man. This, this stuff is powerful, all right? So when a saint is sealed unto the day of redemption, he's sealed by the Holy Spirit. He is sealed, I believe, with seven seals. And he believes the word of God, which is sealed with seven seals, which was purified seven times. Amen? It, it all is tied together. So whether it's the 
the the lampstand with seven candlesticks in it. It's the church. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Bible. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all of us all together in one big happy family. But think about these seven spirits. All right. Think about what they represent. The mystery of the seven stars and how they represent the seven spirits. I want you to be mindful of that. In Amos chapter 5, I like this. Seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion, and turneth the shadow of death into the morning, and maketh the day dark with night, that calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. And I want you to look at this. Seek him that maketh the seven stars. Is there a religion in the world where people worship or follow or serve stars? It's astrology. What then, since we know that the seven stars are these seven what? Angels. Seek him that maketh the seven stars. Angels and stars, they were created. God made them. And so here God is telling you, don't seek after the stars. Don't get into astrology. Don't think that the stars dictate your fortune and your future. That's not true. Don't seek the stars themselves. That is Mystery Babylon's religion. Mystery Babylon will conceal things and hide things. She'll hide the truth about things. She does not want you to seek out and serve the Lord who made the seven stars. She's going to trick you into believing that there's power in worshiping the seven stars or following after the stars and their alignments in astrology. Astrology is one of her religions. And her religion of astrology, whether it's astrology, necromancy, witchcraft, cardomancy, which is using cards like tarot cards or Watch it, even some of these games that kids are playing now. All of, those, all of those different religious practices and so on are all governed over by Mystery Babylon the Great. And so God tells you, don't seek the seven stars. Seek him that maketh the seven stars. Because we're going to see here in a little bit that these... There's an understanding about seven stars. If we take it, the seven stars, seven angels of the, of the churches of God, that's good. Turn it upside down. There are seven spirits that rule and govern in this earth, and I'm going to show you that. Revelation chapter 17, verse 3, So he carried me in the way in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of, the, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads, and ten horns. I want you to notice these seven heads. Verse 7. The angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. He's going to tell you this mystery. This mystery of the seven heads is, I think, related to the mystery of the seven stars. And if you remember, if we were to go back and look at all the other videos that we made in this series, what I was showing you is, is that while there are different aspects and different ways of looking at each one of these mysteries, like the mystery of godliness and the mystery of iniquity, and uh, behold, I show you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, we shall all be changed, and this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. While all of these, I, I do see that they are separate in that they give a different detail, I think all of them together point to the same idea and the same principle along with God. Think about, behold, I show you a mystery, we should not all sleep, we shall be all be changed. What is that? It's the rapture, the translation. Well, what is the joining together of Christ and his bride, the church, that Paul said this is a great mystery? It's when Christ calls us, we go into the air, we meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're with him right then. That's our marriage. And I think that they are all part of the same idea and same philosophy. So anyway, he's going to tell us the mystery now of the seven, the, the, um, the seven heads. I think the Bible is going to tell us that they represent seven spirits, seven unholy 
spirits. Whereas when, when Paul tells us that we all have one body, there is one head of that body, Jesus Christ, which means that Christ does the singular thinking for the entire body. In the case of the beast, the Antichrist, or even the devil, he doesn't have one head. He has seven. Seven individual heads, seven ways of thinking about things. If you were to put seven good people together and have them go through the Bible and start talking about things that they believed in, you're going to have people not happy with one another after a while because you can't get seven people on this earth to agree about everything. It's not possible. So, and we're talking about good people, especially in the devil's realm. You've got seven heads, each with seven brains, each with their own way of thinking. You remember what Jesus said? A nation or a kingdom divided against itself will not stand. I think it's feasible that one of the heads doesn't like one of the other heads and they don't they want to go this way but no we want to go you see the confusion there how do you get the seven heads to all go in the same direction and do the same thing I don't think you do I think that's proof that the devil's kingdom is divided and it will fall in the last days think of this number seven Isaiah chapter 14 that's seven times two verse 14 which is seven times two we find Lucifer's it's not a seven-point plan five-point plan. But the last thing that Lucifer says in his heart, I will be like the Most High. I will be like the Most High. Seven words. Got it? Okay. Seven words. I think seven unholy, wicked, evil spirits. And I'm not, the language that I'm using is biblical language, and I'm going to show you that in a little bit. But I've got the graphic here of what's called in Eastern mysticism, the seven chakras and those seven chakras or wheels or energy points are the little bunny trail that the serpent in kundalini that is down trapped and held in bondage down at the base of your spine which is your your bum all right that's where he is and by the way as far as i'm concerned that's where he belongs but anyway, here you have this serpent down there, and he's got to travel up the seven energy points, the seven gates, the seven wheels, the seven levels or layers to get to the pineal gland so they can activate it. So when the pineal gland's activated, it releases this chemical that makes you go to sleep. So their version of an awakening is you going to sleep. They that sleep in, sleep in the night, they that be drunk are drunken in the night. And that's what that's all about. These seven chakras, I believe, represent the seven heads of the beast, the seven heads of the dragon or the serpent, and seven very evil spirits. Do you remember this? Here is the Buddha, and here is the spirit that guides the Buddha. It's a serpent with seven heads. I mean, if you just think about it and just look at it and as plain as day right here, Buddhism is Satan worship. They're worshiping the dragon with seven heads. That's, what, that's the spirit that brought... I, I learned just a little bit about the Buddha. He tried everything in the world to try to find this enlightenment. He sits under this tree and he has all these visions and so on. But under this particular tree, he gets his enlightenment. And what brings him enlightenment is this serpent with seven heads. Buddha received these seven spirits in him. And they're not the Holy Spirit. What does the Bible say about them? Here's what Manly Hall says about that. The seven-headed snake represents the supreme deity manifesting through his Elohim or seven spirits by whose aid he established his universe. So he's telling you the seven-headed serpent represents a Elohim that wants to be like the most high. 
See, he's saying it. He's just not saying the, the way the Bible says it. By whose aid he established his universe. Revelation chapter 17, verse 9. And here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. See, now we're, now we're kind of getting a little bit better understanding. These are seven, I think, seven spirits. I think they are seven kings. And I don't think that these kings are like Prince Charles and Prince Juan Carlos and the king of Saudi Arabia or the king Elvis Presley. I don't think that they are human kings. Human kings can be disobeyed. Human kings can be killed. Human kings can be rebelled against and put down. Spiritual kings cannot but by the power of Jesus Christ and his word. So I think these seven kings, the seven heads, which are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and there are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And so I think these, this seven-headed beast, and these heads represent seven spiritual entities that rule over mankind as kings. But he said there's seven mountains. Now she sits on these seven mountains. There's a teaching in the law, and I know I've brought this up before, but there's a teaching in the law that talks about a woman who's unclean. And obviously, Mystery Babylon is not clean. She's full of, she has a cup full of filthiness. She is unclean. When a woman is in her uh, uncleanness, okay? You all know what that is. When she's in her uncleanness, she is unclean for a certain amount of days. So is everything that she sits on. Everything that she sits on is unclean. She has defiled these seven mountains. You know what I found out? I found out that the teaching to conquer and to rule over and to take control of seven mountains, that's in the charismatic movement. Here's one of them right here. Reclaiming the seven mountains. Take possession of the land uh, the Lord your God is giving you for your own. Business, government, family, religion, media, education, entertainment. You know what this is part of? This is part of what's called Kingdom Now theology. It's dominionism. It is post-millennialism. It's the idea that God is going to empower the church who is Joel's army, not He's going to empower the church. They're going to become a new breed. Think about that. They're going to have their DNA changed. The church is going to, he's going to, they're going to be empowered by God, and they're going to take control of the seven mountains of the world, which means that they are going to have dominion over everything in the world. And then, once they have taken control of everything, they're going to hand that control over to Jesus when he comes. I'm sorry, that's not how it works. Christ is the one who's going to come down and get control, and we just get to come down with him. That's what the Bible teaches. But dominionism is nothing but a veiled reference to the seven mountains that the woman sits on, the, the whore. She sits on and defiles these seven mountains. Here's another one, the book, The Seven Mountain Prophecy, Unveiling the Coming Elijah Revolution. Invading the seven mountains with intercession. All of these charismatic, apostolic Joel's army crowd, they're all about Mystery Babylon the Great and her taking custody of these seven mountains. These, you might even say the, the seven continents in the world, the seven seas. She takes control over everything that is in the earth and there are church people who have been conned into believing that that applies to them here's another one the global apostolic network the kingdom of god the 7m coalition you know what that is seven mountains it's the charismatic joel's army crowd taking over the seven mountains of the world now proverbs 6 verse 16 says something very interesting these six things doth the lord hate yea seven there it is are an abomination unto him. Number one, a proud look. Number two, a lying tongue. Number three, hands that shed innocent blood. Four, an heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Five, feet that be swift in running to mischief. Six, a false witness that speaketh lies. Number seven, 
he that soweth discord among brethren. There's this picture of that in your Bible, okay? In Matthew chapter, let's see, where is it? Chapter 13. There is the story, the parable. Parables, they're real, they happen. There is the parable of a man who sowed his field, and at night his enemy came in and sowed tares in among his wheat. You know what he did? He sowed discord. Because while you were supposed to look out and see all the happy wheat being all happy together in the same field, now intermixed in these beautiful, majestic wheat stalks that are rising up from the ground, you have tares, things that are no good for people. The, the seed that the enemy sowed, discorded. You know, what that, you know what discord means? It means it's like, if you know anything about music, it's like taking your hand and just laying it down harshly on top of the piano keys and all those keys playing together, they don't sound right. No one has ever made a hymn by just pressing their feet down or letting their cat walk up and down the keys of the keyboard. No one writes Christian song, well, and there might be a few. But anyway, here's my point with this thing. Discorded or things that, when, when you have discord, you have a chord that has been broken up and, and made into something that's displeasing and not honorable, not very pleasant to listen to. When you have a family and somebody comes and sows seeds of discord in that family, what they're trying to do is discord the harmony that that family has together. When you have a church, it's the same thing. And isn't it interesting that what we find here in Matthew chapter 13, the, the tares sown in among the wheat, there's a lot of different applications to this. But think of Daniel chapter 2. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of mint. There it is right there. So the word sowing discord is a seed terminology. Sowing seeds, uh, he that soweth discord among brethren. Think of, um, think of Monsanto and all the other seed companies that are adding things to the DNA of rice, corn, wheat, soybeans, you name it. They're adding things to it. You know what they're doing? They're sowing discord among the brethren of these, of these seeds that all have the same DNA. That's what's going on in our churches. That's what's going to happen in this world, is that they are going to sow a seed of discord to break apart the power of God's people and the power and the influence of the gospel in the last days. And it's all being done, I think, by these seven unholy spirits. These seven spirits are represented by the seven classical planets of antiquity. Here's a Wikipedia article. Listen, listen, you're going to, oh, you're going to like this. I saw this and I went, oh, look at that. Because there's something, you'll see it, all right? In antiquity, the classical planets were the seven non-fixed objects visible in the sky, which means they roamed around. They were not fixed in place. The classical planets were therefore the sun, moon, the five planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, which is the seventh. The name planet comes from the Greek term planetes, meaning wanderer. As ancient astronomers noted how certain lights moved across the sky with the other stars. They called these objects asteres planetae or wandering stars. Did you catch that? Do you know what Peter and Jude called the false prophets of the last days? Wandering stars. Seven planets. And, and I don't know if you, if you understand this, you'll see like, or I see Orion every winter. And it's about the only one I recognize in the winter. Uh, in the summertime, the Big Dipper. That's easy. Okay, it looks like a Big Dipper. All right? And what that means is, is that every year when the Big Dipper comes around at night, all the stars are in the exact same place as they were last year. Okay? And then you can count on them that way. They are fixed stars. Polaris, the, the North Star, is a fixed star. It doesn't move. Okay? Um, and navigators used to use the stars to navigate and to tell where they were. All right? So they need those fixed stars. The seven planets were things that moved beyond the fixation of all the other stars 
in the heavens. And it was the sun, it was the moon. It didn't have a set place every night in the same year after year. The sun, uh, moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And they were called planets because that term literally meant wandering stars. And that's what Peter and Jude, how they referred to the false prophets and the false teachers of the last days. And guess what they have in them? They don't have the same seven spirits that you and I have. You know how you can tell? They won't adhere to this because here's the seven spirits right here. They won't stick to this because this never moves. It stays put. It's fixed. It's stable. You can navigate your life by it and know it to be true. But the seven planets, the seven wandering stars, are these spirits that are tossing everybody to and fro. People being carried about with every wind of doctrine. They are one thing one day and another thing another day. And they just keep going from this to this to this. And that's just the nature of the seven evil spirits that they're under. They can't be fixed. They can't be static. They can't be still. They have no ability to be. God designed them to where they're just all over the place. And the false prophets of the last days are led by those spirits. Isn't that, isn't that neat? Deuteronomy chapter 7, we have, a, we have a picture of these seven spirits, these seven kings, these seven heads, these the mystery of the seven stars, as it were. Deuteronomy 7, 1, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, that's two, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven, what? Nations. Greater and mightier than thou. These seven, and you know what God said to him? When you go into that land, don't follow their religion. Don't do after their practice. Don't learn after them. So you know what Israel did? They went in to learn from them. And Israel still is under that curse and under those seven spirits to this very day. This is why I get, I get pretty put out when people start talking about how great it is to be Hebrew roots and all this stuff. Because I know what's at the core of it. What's at the core of it is Baal and Ashtaroth worship that was introduced to the Israelites when they went into Canaan land. The seven nations that were stronger and mightier than them were ruled over by the seven wandering star spirits and gave them and taught them all of these false teachings and all of these false doctrines. And Israel to this day, the Jew to this day, does not have the Holy Spirit of the Word of God living in them, the seven spirits of God. They have seven wandering stars in them. Proverbs 26, 25. Bible says, when he speaketh fair, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart, whose hatred is covered by deceit. His wickedness shall be showed before the whole congregation. Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone. Can you think of something called, ah, oh, just wait for it. Um, he, Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone, it, shall return, it will return upon him. A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. And isn't it interesting that you have a group called the Rolling Stones? Okay? That, and do the Rolling Stones, who sing a song called Sympathy for the Devil and Goat Head Soup, do you think that they have seven abominations in their heart? Do you think they're led by seven evil spirits? I absolutely do. Okay, man. Uh, here's what Manley Hall says again in Secret Teaching of All Ages. It was, it was held to be the number, it's talking about the number seven. It was held to be the number of religion because man is controlled by seven celestial spirits, celestial means of the stars, to whom it is proper for him to make offerings. And to that, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children 
of disobedience. Man is con- Here's what Manly Hall said. Man is controlled by seven celestial spirits. Well, Paul said that man, lost people, children of disobedience, are controlled by the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in children of disobedience. That spirit is the spirit of Antichrist. Seven heads, seven kings, seven evil spirits. In the Kabbalah, remember, God said to Israel, don't go learn the seven nations religion. Don't learn it. So they went in there and they learned it. And now their God, represented by the Sephiroth, this tree of life, their God, look at it. It has seven levels and ten circles. Dun, dun, dun. You know what that is? You're looking right here at the beast. Seven heads, ten horns, ten crowns. Wow. The Jews' religion, which is where Jim Staley and Rabbi Ralph Messer and Perry Stone and even Chuck Missler to a degree, all of these people that are going all goo-goo over uh, Hebrew letter picture graphs that uh, every letter is an individual word or sentence and, a, and there are secret doctrines hidden in each of the Hebrew letters. That didn't come from God. It didn't come from Moses at Mount Sinai. It came from the spirit of the Antichrist itself. And the Jews right now worship the beast. And those who have fallen for their lies, the Hebrew roots me, but the people, the sacred name people, and many others who are going to the Jewish thought in order to try to gain a some sort of expanded knowledge of who Christ is. Well, here's the problem. The Jews, they didn't know who Christ was. They didn't know who they were. They were looking right at their Messiah hanging on the cross, and they had no idea who that was. You know why? God put them under seven spirits. They were under seven abominations. Seven kings were ruling over them, and to this day, their main symbol is this right here. And it has seven levels, or seven heads, and ten horns, and ten crowns. Wow. Now, look at these seven levels. Think about like a ladder with seven steps. That's in masonry. And how you're going to get from here to heaven. Well, masonry, and Judaism, and witchcraft, and all these other performance-based religions will say, well, you've got to climb the ladder. You've got to go up the levels, or up the steps. In all the mystery schools, there was always like a staircase or a ladder or a tower of some kind that had seven steps or seven layers to it. And every time you got to one layer, you had to then go to the next layer and so on and so on. And believe it or not, there's, I hear preachers talking about how we need to go on the next level with God. We need to get to a, next, a higher level with God. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something the Bible says. There are two types of people in this world, saved and lost people. And the saved people, there are not some who are, well, they're six levels up from, from you in salvation. So they probably have more to, they probably have a better understanding than you do of who God really is. I've heard them say that that's a lie. Look at this. Look at all these books being written. Christian so-called books. The seven levels of intimacy. The seven levels of communication. Seven levels of healing, seven levels of promise for the overcomer, seven levels of intimacy, lighthouse Catholic media. It's always about, in, in the Catholic Church, they have seven, um, what is that, seven sacraments that if you perform these seven levels, these seven things, if you do them, well then you can, you might be in purgatory less then you might eventually get to go to heaven if you perform and I'm telling you I submit to you that that doctrine of levels of salvation and levels of some people are going to get greater this because they are smarter this or they didn't have a TV set or they cut their hair short or they gave more money or any of this other nonsense and garbage about works based salvation and works based blessings in heaven I submit to you that that is not of the seven spirits of God in this Bible. Seven different spirits. Mary Magdalene, you remember her? 
she actually knew all about this. I think, I have a little theory. Let me read this verse, Luke 8, 2. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. Look at there. I think it's possible that Mary Magdalene was involved in Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. Doesn't say that per se, but what we just found out about Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah is that there are seven devils, seven heads. And she was mixed up in that, and she had seven devils possessing her. Oh. You know who I think she is? I think, I think she's a prototype of Israel. I think she is. I think she is a foreshadowing of Israel where God is going to take her, Israel, cast out her seven devils of Kabbalah and give her the seven spirits of God. And she's to be sealed with them. Revelation chapter 7. There is a Disney movie, a childhood story about a woman guarded and protected by seven spirits. Dun, dun, da! Snow White, the seven dwarves. See the apple? Think about it. You know who she represents? Dan Brown talks about this in the Da Vinci Code. She represents the sacred feminine. She represents this, this mystery Gaia, Diana principle, Shekinah, Sophia. She represents the female aspect, Shekinah, and she has seven spirits with her. The seven minors are the seven layers in the Kabbalah, the seven chakras in Eastern mysticism, the seven gates to hell, and all of these other sevens that are out there. I think that's, that's exactly what she's all about. Now we have a story. We have something Jesus taught us about these seven spirits and how to be careful about what happens. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Did you see that? Those seven unclean spirits, I think pictured by those seven devils, those seven abominations, those seven things that God hates, the seven heads of the beast, the seven heads of the dragon, the opposite of the seven spirits of God. That's what that mystery, I think, is all about. And the Bible is revealing this to us. I think the seven nations that are greater and mightier than Israel, I think they are a picture of the evil angels that are cast out of heaven in Revelation chapter 12 and they come down to the earth to rule over the people of the earth. Just a theory I have, but you think about that, all right? Now we got one last mystery to talk about. One, one more, okay? And this is the favorite right here, and then I'll be done. Revelation chapter 10, verse 5. The angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer. It doesn't mean that time's going to stop. It means that the appointed time has expired and now God is going to do what he set forth to do. Time no longer. In other words, eh, your time is up. Now God's going to do something. And what is he going to do when it's in the fullness of time or the dispensation of the fullness of time? That's a better way of looking at it. Time no longer. God says this, this time is over right here, right now. 
But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, that's the seventh trumpet, the last trump, the mystery of God should be finished as he has declared to his servants, the prophets. I know this is probably going to mess with some people's eschatology. Now I'm going to say that I do not have all the answers. If I did, I would make a video on it. But I believe that we are translated at the last trump. I believe that that translation is related to the last trump, and it's related to what Paul said, showing us a mystery. We shall not all sleep, we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. I also believe that that mystery is related to, Paul said, behold, I, um, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. I think they are all interrelated and connected. And I think that right now, Israel, the Jews, are under seven evil spirits. And they inhabit those seven evil spirits, like the seven heads of the beast and the seven heads of the, of the devil. They inhabit Israel right now and keep them in bondage and keep them, the God of this world has blinded their minds and they can't see what it is that they need to see. All right? I think that when we go up, the mystery that Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 15 and Ephesians chapter 5, I think that mystery is going to be over and you and I will be with Christ forever. But I also think that what Paul talked about the mystery, he said, behold, um, um, blindness in part is happening to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. I think right here when the mystery of God is finished, that we go up, the man of sin is revealed, because he's part of that mystery too, and Israel has their eyes open, and they now know that Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, is their Messiah. Now again, I, this, this might mess with what you heard in Sunday school 20 years ago, okay? And again, I don't think I have all the answers, but I think there's a connection here. If I were to look at the scriptures, Honestly, without all the tagalongs of everything I've learned over the years, I think Revelation 10, 7 connects with 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and all of the other mystery things that we've seen so far. And I think at this event, when the mystery of God is finished, there's something else that's going to be finished too. Back to Joshua chapter 6, verse 4. Remember, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound the seven trumpets, right? What's in Joshua chapter 6? Seven trumpets. Seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat. This is Babylon the great falling people. And the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. By the way, there's, there's trumpets sounding, and the people are shouting. What is it we're waiting for? The trump, the shout, the people ascending up. And Mystery Babylon to be over and done with. Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and the four beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns. Look at that. And seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. You know how to end the mystery? Turn the lights on. Okay? That's how the mystery is going to be over. Remember, Moses came down from Mount Sinai the second time with his face shining like the sun, and it was so bright, the Israelites said, put veil over that. Good grief, what are you killing us here? So he veiled the light. It's covered, it's hidden, it's a mystery. And here's Jesus, who just happens to have seven horns like a lamb they're the seven spirits of god and i think when the light of the gospel comes on and the seven spirits of god illuminate israel i think she's going to know 
that Jesus is her Messiah because Mystery Babylon, she's done. It's over. She can deceive them no more. Isaiah 21, 9, And behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. All the graven images of her gods he hath broken under the ground. Revelation 14, 8, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. There's going to come a time, people, when God's going to say, this is enough. I've had it. It's the fullness of times. We're ready. Let's get it on. And God is going to destroy this earth. He's going to destroy the wickedness in this earth. He's going to destroy mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And she will have power over no one ever again. Told you, nobody gets away with anything. And God is going to judge in righteous judgment. Amen? I love it. I, I, I love the feeling that I kind of finished a series and now we're ready to move on to something else. I have no idea what it's going to be yet. But I also love how it ends. It always ends with God's people sending up. Amen. This is Pastor Mike. It's been good to be with you. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.